We're continuing with our sermon series, How to Worship God. And if you will look inside your bulletin, you can pull out the insert that you find there. And those are the scriptures and the sermon notes you can follow along with today. My goal for this series is to help us as a congregation understand what the Bible says about worship so we will grow and mature in our worship, whether we are here in a public worship setting or even in our home in a private worship setting. Worship of God is the most basic attitude and action that we have in our Christian faith. Worship is our response of love to God loving us first. And of course, we understand some of that definition of worship from the greatest commandment, which is our memory verse for this series, Matthew 22, 37 and 38. I hope you've been memorizing it. Maybe you already know it. Let's say it together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Matthew's first and greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37 and 38. I got a little ahead of myself there. Thank you all for correcting me. So far in this series, we've looked at kind of a definition, a biblical understanding of worship. Also, we've looked at, last week, biblical attitudes for worship. So I hope you have the right attitude today. But today, part three, the title is Developing Biblical Styles for Worship. One Sunday morning, a mother took her six-year-old daughter to worship for the very first time. And you can imagine a six-year-old being very curious, had lots of questions. So during the worship service, the daughter leaned over and said, Mom, why are we standing and singing? And the mom said to her six-year-old daughter, we're standing to show our praise and honor to God, and we're singing out our praise and honor to God. Of course, a little bit later in the service, the little girl leaned over and said, Mom, why are we bowing our heads and closing our eyes? And the mom whispered to her, well, we want to put away any distractions, so we bow our head and close our eyes, and we focus on praying to God. Then, of course, as the service went by, the girl leaned over again and said, Mom, why are people putting money in that plate? <laughs> and the mother said, well, the Bible teaches us to give an offering to God. We're to give 10% of our income to the Lord. So we're doing that right now as a part of our worship. Then, of course, the preacher stood up, and he'd been preaching about 25 minutes. <laughs> And the six-year-old girl leaned over and said, Mom, why is that man talking so long? <laughs> That's not the punchline yet, y'all. <laughs> and the mom leaned over and said, Well, that's the pastor. He, he's a smart man, and he wants to tell us what he knows. So about five minutes later, the pastor ended his sermon, and the little girl leaned over and said, Mom, I'm so glad the pastor's not too smart. <laughs> I'm sure that we all have felt like that little girl at times wanting to say, why are we doing this in worship? Well, today I want us to look at some biblical styles of worship so we'll better understand why do we do what we do in worship. Now, there is no one certain scripture that we can turn to that will tell us, here is how you're to do worship, and this is the only way you can do it. That scripture doesn't exist. But when you study through the Bible, you see several instances of worship, we have private worship or public worship, and from that we get an idea of how we are to worship. We don't have time to look at all those scriptures, but we're going to look at some today to help us better understand the biblical styles of worship. And the point of this sermon, the point I want to get across to you, is whatever we do, we have to make sure that it is biblical. Otherwise, we don't need to be doing that. So look at number one on your notes. Here's the first idea. In order to worship God, we must include a variety of elements in our format. Now, within Scripture, there are several Scriptures that describe, as I said, public and private worship. And from those Scriptures we find different elements of worship. And one passage we can look at is in Isaiah when God spoke and called Isaiah to be his, pri his 
prophet. So this is a, an example of a private worship service between Isaiah and God. So as I read this passage, it's Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. As I read through it, look for different elements of worship and what's going on. So let's look at this passage, Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs. Each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts post, and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And when he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So what a very powerful, dynamic, and miraculous experience of worship. I mean, the fact that Isaiah saw God seated on his throne and then lived to tell about it, that's one miracle that I see in this passage. But from this experience of worship, I've listed here on your notes a couple of ideas and elements about worship. We see here there's praise happening, there's confession of sin, there's forgiveness, there's God's call to Isaiah, and of course then a response from Isaiah. So first of all, there's praise. Isaiah sees these heavenly beings, these heavenly angels called seraphs, each of them having six wings. They were praising God. And another miracle here is that Isaiah heard them and understood what they were saying. I don't know what language they were speaking. Isaiah doesn't tell us that. But he understood what these seraphs were saying as they were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Now, the sound of them was so powerful that what happened? The temple was shaking and it fo smoke filled the entire temple. So there is that element of praise. Then there's confession of sin as Isaiah cries out, whoa, <laughs> I'm ruined. I've seen God and I'm a person of unclean limbs, lips. Now, I probably would have said the same thing and then run away. <laughs> I don't know about you. I would have gotten out of there. But Isaiah continues to admit his own sin Having, and then having seen God. Now last week, you may remember when we were talking about attitudes for worship, one of the attitudes as well as an action I mentioned was that of repentance. We need to come before God with repentance. And we see that here in this passage as well. We, when we are in the presence of God, when we are in the presence of His holiness, what does it show? It shows that we are sinful and we need to repent. So after that time of repentance then, our and confession of sin, Isaiah is now approached by one of these seraphs with coal in the tongs of his hand. And he proceeds, it says, to touch Isaiah's lips with the coal. Now this act, of course, represents forgiveness. His sin is atoned for. I have eaten uh, hot peppers before. I think habanero peppers is the hottest I've ever put in my mouth, and I will never do that again. But had I been in a situation where someone came at me with a hot coal to touch my lips, again, I'd be out of the temple. <laughs> but forgiveness is given, right? And then after the forgiveness, God speaks, and he, he's calling out for someone to help. He's giving an invitation and then finally, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And that is the response. So even though this is a private time of worship between Isaiah and God, we do see these elements of praise. There's the confession of sin. There's the forgiveness. God's calling out. God inviting. And then finally, the response. 
In the Bible, we see a lot more elements of worship found in Scripture. And I want to just point out some to you. We've listed a few here, but some more would be obviously singing and praying. That's a part of worship. Fasting, preaching, reading of Scripture, clapping and dancing, shouting, raising of hands. And then kind of the opposite, there is bowing, there is kneeling, lying prostrate on the floor is one example we see. Stillness and quietness. And then, of course, giving an offering, giving thanks, playing instruments, baptisms, communion, and healing. All of those are biblical elements of worship that we see in the Bible. There are a variety of them. When my wife and I first started in ministry, we lived in Leesville, South Carolina, and uh, on Lake Murray. But Leesville, South Carolina was known for one of its restaurants called Sheely's Barbecue. The family, the Sheely family was a big family in that community, and some of them were even members of our church. But their barbecue restaurant had a huge buffet. And of course, it had different kinds of barbecue on it. But as you walk through the buffet, there was nothing fat-free on that buffet. It was full of calories. There was nothing gluten-free on there. I mean, it was just, you go there to eat and eat some more. We as human beings like those kind of choices. We like going to a restaurant that has a buffet because we know there's a variety and we'll find something that we like. But think about if you were to go to a buffet restaurant, you know it's a buffet restaurant, and you get there, and all they have on the buffet is green beans. That'd be really disappointing, wouldn't it? Even if you like green beans, if that was the only thing on the buffet, you would be disappointed. The Bible gives to us a variety of elements to include in our worship of God. If all we did was sing for two hours, those of you who don't sing would be disappointed. If all we did was listen to a sermon for two hours and we didn't sing and didn't pray, you wouldn't come, would you? <laughs> we need variety. The Bible has a variety of elements concerning worship, and we need to make sure that we are including the biblical elements of worship in our worship service, whether we're here publicly or even privately. So search for them in Scripture. Look for the elements of worship and include them in your worship. Now, second idea. Look at number two on the back of your notes there. In order to worship God, we must include diversity in our music. So music and singing, that's just one element that we discussed a minute ago. But even within that one element, there is diversity. Paul makes it clear in two different places that we are to have diversity in our music. First in Colossians and also in Ephesians. I want to read both of these. First of all, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. A very similar passage from Paul is in Ephesians 5, 19, and 20. It says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God for God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul in these passages mentions three specific types of music, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, we can't just immediately think we know what that means. We have to understand what it meant when he wrote it. What type of music was Paul talking about when he wrote that down? Well, Psalms is pretty obvious. That would have referred to the Old Testament Psalms that we still have in the Old Testament, the Psalms of King David and others who wrote them. They would have been singing that music in that day and time. So he's saying, let's sing those Psalms. And then he mentions hymns. Hymns, but what he meant by that was the contemporary music of that day and time, songs about Jesus. This was a first century church. This was the first time they would have been worshiping Jesus. So they had hymns or songs about Jesus. That was their contemporary music. And then he mentions spiritual songs. That would have been songs of personal testimony or spontaneous singing or even sometimes spontaneous chanting, like we think about monks chanting in a monastery somewhere. So they were to sing the psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs. We understand what that meant. The psalms that we have in the Old Testament, their contemporary music, and then the spontaneous singing of the heart. 
What we don't understand from this passage is how the music sounded. We don't know what it sounded like. There's no way for us to exactly know how those psalms, those ancient psalms that they grew up with, how those sounded. We don't know how their contemporary hymns sounded. We don't know how their spontaneous spiritual songs would have sounded. We do have in the Bible some of the lyrics, some of the words of the songs, but we don't have the notes, do we? So there's no way to know that. So what do we take away from these scriptures of Paul? What we learn here is that God likes diversity of music. God is the one who created music. Yes, everything that God creates, Satan perverts. But Satan can't create music, okay? God creates music. God created this, type, this music. In the 1960s, The Sound of Music came out, starring Julie Andrews. There was a theater manager in Korea that wanted to show the movie. So like most theater managers, he previewed the movie, and he, his first thought was, this is too long. <laughs> no one is going to sit through this long movie. So you know what he did? He cut out all the music. <laughs> I think he kind of missed the point of the movie, didn't he? It's called The Sound of Music. And he cut out all the music to make the movie shorter. Not a good idea. Now we have movies that are three hours plus, don't we? And we still sit there. Without a diversity of music, sometimes we miss the point of worship. Now here's something interesting. This wouldn't apply to all of us, but most of us. Researchers tell us that most of us, not all of us, most of us prefer the style of music that we listened to when we first started dating. Can y'all remember that? Think back a little bit. <laughs> no. Paul, did they have music back then when you first started? They had silent movies. <laughs> silent, movies. <laughs> silent movies, yeah. So most of us prefer the style of music that we listened to when we first started dating. For example, if when you first started dating, you were listening to country music, then that's probably what you prefer today. Or when you first started dating, if you listened to big band music, then that may be the style of music that you prefer today. Personally, I have grown up with a variety of styles of music, and I've learned to uh, appreciate them a little more. I like today, I like listening to some classical as well as jazz. I do like pop music as well as big band music. I've even been to two operas in New York City at the Metropolitan Opera, and I enjoyed it immensely. I took my wife to one of them. I enjoyed it so much. But here's a great truth, and you need to hear this carefully. Just because you and I prefer a certain style of music doesn't mean that God prefers one style over another. God has created all styles of music. And therefore, we have to allow for diversity in our worship. There are congregations today, and I've been to them, that play country music in their worship service. There are some congregations that play classical music in their worship service. There are some congregations that play rock music in their worship service. Do you know what the common ground is in all those styles? The lyrics, the lyrics, that's what makes a song Christian, is the lyrics. The words are all similar in that they honor and praise God, but the music style is different. So there is no one music style that is holier than another. There is no one musical instrument that is holier than another. God likes diversity. So we must embrace that diversity of God in, in using all types of music styles in our worship service. Now, one more idea. Look at number three. In order to worship God, we must include order in our planning. So even though we're going to choose a, uh, several biblical elements and we're going to choose several biblical styles of music, it doesn't mean that our order should be chaotic. 
And you may have been to a chaotic worship service before. I don't like them. I've been to some I don't like. I think the Bible gives us order in the way we do worship. Now, a moment ago, we read from Isaiah, and we read his private worship there and his experience. And even though I was pointing out the elements of worship, it gave to us some type of order. But the one order of worship I really like is found in Psalm, Psalm 95, because it gives us a progression and a movement. So follow along as I read this Psalm, Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Follow along with me. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed a dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So I want to break this passage down and just rem look at kind of the order, the progression of worship. In the first couple of verses here, there's an invitation. There's a calling to come and worship. The first couple of verses, come, it says, let us sing. Let us shout aloud. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. So we see an invitation to come and worship God. Now last Sunday, I emphasized to you these types of scriptures that invite us to worship God. It helps to motivate our hunger for God and hunger being one of the attitudes we need for worship. We need to hunger for God and hunger after God. And there's lots of scriptures, including this one, that motivate us and call us and help to motivate our hunger for God. So this is one of them. Then we also see here some of the elements I mentioned earlier. There's singing, there's music, there's shouting, there's thanksgiving, there's praise. But then after that invitation, after that call to worship, there is the praise about God for who he is and what he's done. Starting in verse 3, it describes God. It says, he's the great God. He's the great king. And his hands are the depths of the earth. And the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he's made it. His hands form the dry land. So now we move from that calling to a time of praise for who God is. Then the very next verse moves to another progression of worship. It goes from praise of God to more an intimate time with God. Verse 6 says, come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. So the elements of shouting and singing and rejoicing are no longer there, but now it's bowing and kneeling, a more intimate time with God, a quieter intimacy with him rather than the shouting and this praising. But finally, in verse 7, there is a response. For he is our God and we are his people. I've been worshiping God and I admit it, he's my God and I belong to him. You see the response there. So in this particular order of worship, I've written it down in your notes, there's that calling to worship, there's praise to God, there's intimacy with God, and finally, a response to God. It's such a simple order of worship, but yet it's powerful. It moves us from point A to point B to point C, calling us to worship and then inviting us to praise him and then inviting us to be more intimate with him and love him, and finally, respond to God. Most of our worship services here at First Baptist follow this simple order of worship. It's important that we have a biblical model to follow, not that we just make something up, but we're following something right out of Scripture. This is not the only one, but it's one that I do like and enjoy to use. And you see, it doesn't matter if we're using hymns or psalms or spiritual songs that we looked at a while ago, it doesn't matter what style the music is, this order of worship fits with all that. It doesn't matter if we're doing a liturgical service or a contemporary service or something else, this particular order of worship fits in all of that. And all those biblical elements that we looked at a while ago, they will fit into this order somewhere in a very progressive way. So we take all the biblical elements of worship and we take all the biblical musical styles of worship and we put them into a biblical order 
so that we can love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. My invitation to you is very simple. It's on the bottom of your notes there. Develop biblical styles in your worship. Whether you're at home or at work or whether you're here at the church, we need to make sure that we are developing biblical styles in our worship. I want to ask you a question for a minute. What, what is most important to you when it comes to worship? Is the style of music most important to you? Or is it the order of worship? Or perhaps all the elements of worship? Which one's most important to you? For me personally, it's that what we do is biblical. That's what's most important. Because if what we're doing isn't biblical, then we're wasting our time. We need to make sure that our styles and our music and our understanding, all of it comes from the Bible. My desire for you is to be able to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and to do it in a biblical way. I truly desire for this to take place in our church and in your homes as well. So bottom line, make sure that your style of worship to God each and every day is biblical. Let's bow in prayer.